journey into comics with your hosts, Nate Phillips and Brandon Stone. I am a god, you dull creature. Hey, what's up, everybody? How's it going? We've been uh, been gone for a few weeks, huh? Yeah, yeah, you know, bi-weekly seems to be the uh, practice, well, since July. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, fair enough. We've been doing about two episodes uh, a month. It's not bad. No, um, no, it, you know, it, it's better than your first episode and then the three-month span or four-month span. Yeah, you know, that was <laughs> weather. That's all I can say. It was weather. I mean, I couldn't control it. Uh, so, I mean, episode nine. Nine. Oh, my God. We're nearing ten. Dude, we're we're almost double digits. That's crazy. I mean, is it odd to think as soon as we hit double digits, I can't wait till triple digits? Oh, man. It's going to come as long as we just keep on keeping on. Yeah, so uh, speaking of keep on keeping on, I did something really... I don't know. I talked to you about it, and I figured... Now is the best time to just try to draw people's attention to us because uh, we have a lot of cool things to show. You have cool uh, video games that you collect, and, and, and I get cool comics, and it's the best place to share pictures that are worth a thousand words is Instagram. So uh, I created a Journey Into Comics Instagram account. Uh, Brandon's posted some stuff, and I've posted some stuff, uh, and I think it's eh, it's going pretty cool, I think, right? Well, yeah, you know, it's a start, and the fact is, you know, to start off with, I just chose some of the video games that I found that were comic-related, um, you know, Batman, Spider-Man, and I don't know if I posted all of them. I think I still got a few on my phone that I just haven't posted yet. I got really busy with work, but I've got, you know, I can post all kinds of stuff there, and, you know, I've built up my game room. I finally have a place for me to go in there and just switch on whichever system I want, and so I really plan on using that, and, you know, being as pro- proactive as that as I am on my own personal Instagram. Yeah. Well, and I I try to remember like, oh hell, we have an Instagram for the podcast. Might as well go post something. <laughs> right. Um, so we mentioned last episode that we had started a Facebook um, that went really well in the first uh, few weeks we've had it. Uh, it's been what three weeks? We've got 150 likes. That's like 50 likes a week. That's not really bad numbers. I tell you what, you know, I mean, when you're starting off small and you're building your audience, you know, it, it's I am ecstatic with the growth of it because our, our friends and family are behind us, but then complete strangers have also found it and decided to like it as well. And I really hope that anyone who's listening to this that hasn't liked us on Facebook, please do so because we that's the main place where you're going to be able to keep up on all the news, new episodes, uh, n- new updates you know we we have a couple of different ideas that we want to start implementing and that's going to be probably the first place that you're going to be able to hear about it oh and brando you forgot the most important one on our facebook we are currently doing a giveaway uh you want to take this one or should i well see i was sort of like holding back because i was going to let you talk about it because you sent me a message like was it last week the week before telling me you got something pretty special and you can and you were saying, hey, do you want this, or should we do a giveaway? And I'm like, well, give it away, man. Let's give this Let's give this as a, people, as, as a gift back to people who have already liked us and given us support so far. And not, you know, not so much as to try and like, bribe people into coming in. I don't want to do that. Just as a, to show our own appreciation for people who take their time out of their day to download the podcast on iTunes, by the way, cheap plug, <laughs> that was a good hey, one too. You slipped hey, it right buddy, in. Yeah, slipped it right in. But anyway, yeah. I mean, you know, if you guys support us, I want to support you back, and I want to shoot some ba- something back to you every once in a while. And I thought this was just a great idea, so I'll let Nate take over and tell you exactly what it is we're talking about. Yeah. So, um, as you guys know, uh, during the few weeks we were off from the show, uh, something kind of big in San Diego happened. Uh, and uh, for those of you who saw Godzilla, no, Godzilla did not appear in San Diego. Um, well, he sort of did, but we'll maybe get down to that later. I don't know. I didn't really think about it, but whatever. Anyways, um, the San Diego Comic-Con happened, and they had something that I had to get. Uh, they had the uh, Walking Dead 129 San Diego Comic-Con variant. Uh, I found a seller that 
actually offered a really good deal for two of them. So I purchased two, one for my own collection. And as Brando said, I was going to give one to him. And then he kind of was like, you know, give back to the fans. I think that's the best thing. So here's what we're doing right now. If you are listening to us and you haven't liked us on Facebook, you like us on Facebook. When we reach 200 likes, I'm going to go to a random number generator. I'm going to put in the values 1 to 200. I'm going to push it. Then we're going to determine if we're going to go from the top or the bottom. We will count down or up whatever number it is. And whoever gets picked as the winner, you'll give us your address. We'll ship it to you for free. You get a variant comment comic for free so i just want to add here that i've done a giveaway on facebook before and unfortunately you actually can't pick the winner just by the who likes your page because it actually doesn't tell you everybody so what we're going to have to do when we reach 200 likes that is when we're giving away the comic so what we're going to do is that we're going to make a post on our facebook uh this is the official like this post if you like that post you are entered to win liking our facebook doesn't really enter you to win but liking that post does. But we want to get to 200 likes to sort of increase our audience a little bit and to give back to those people who, who have already liked us and then also give back to people who, are, who like us again. So once that happens, we will do exactly what he said. So I, I just want to interject there to like let you know that we're going to be putting up a post as soon as we hit 200 saying, like this post right here, share it, like it, make sure everybody who likes this page can see it because Facebook likes to be dicks and doesn't show all of our posts to all of our audience. Yeah, and I don't get that either. My biggest issue, and I was just talking about this the other day, my biggest issue with Facebook is they have created a social media market, and then at the same time they have done so many things to screw over the people who need to utilize social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, Inviting friends is difficult. You can't just hit a select all and boom, invite all your friends. You have to individually select every single friend to like. And by the way, if you're on our Facebook and you like us, you can actually tell all your friends to like us by inviting them as well. Um, But the other thing that's kind of a problem is, is that people don't necessarily see your post unless they, what, subscribe to the news feed? Well, see, what they've done is that when you like the page now, apparently you automatically subscribe to it now, which I didn't know until just this weekend. But you ha- we have to pay now, Nate, in order to make sure our audience sees what we want them to see. I hate the capitalistic universe. Well, see, it can be gifting, and it can be such a blessing at times. And at the, at the other time, turning everything into a moneymaker – you know, it, it, it's almost a head scratcher. I get what they're trying to do. And I would actually sort of agree with it to an extent of trying to broaden your audience. Okay, if we pay you 10 bucks or 100 bucks, then our ad will appear on your Facebook feed. So, hey, go like these guys are pretty cool. I get that. But to do that, to just get to the audience that has already decided to like your page, they, they've already committed to the fact that they want to see your content. And yet it's only sending it to a certain percentage of them. And that, you know, I'm on another page, as we mentioned before, and that and that's very frustrating over on that page. We have right about the same numbers likes as the Journey to Comics page, but only like only like 21 people see it sometimes. And I'm just I sit there scratching my head. So then when I see that, I share it. So if you like our page, please do what you can. If you see it, please share it. So other people can see it, you know. Maybe people on, on on your page don't want to see that stuff, and that's fine. I'm not asking you to like push us down everybody's throats, but just to ensure that you know more people of our actual audience wants to see it, gets to see it. Maybe they're your friends too, but you know that is very frustrating. Yeah, it really is. Um, so we're talking about this giveaway, and go to facebook.com backslash journey into comics podcast. Um, that's where you can find us, Instagram at Journey Into Comics. We don't have a Twitter, sorry. You guys know where to listen to us on I- iTunes and Podcast Addict, as we've talked about. But about this giveaway and San Diego Comic-Con, I know, Brandon, you had some things you wanted to discuss. I've got some things about SDCC that I wanted to discuss. We've got a couple we could probably discuss together. Um, mm-hmm. Might as well move the ball down the road, see what the hell happens, right? Exactly, and I, you know what? Since we talked about giving away an issue of the copy, a copy of like the, the, the Walking Dead variant, let's just go right into the Walking Dead panel. 
and also the trailer that that debuted for the upcoming season. Dude, that trailer um actually had me terrified for the group. Like I was like where are we going? Like I've read every issue that's ever come out of The Walking Dead, but what is Kirkman planning? I can't get a read and I think that's what he's doing so well. He's keeping people like me guessing. Well, see, yeah, and, and I'm in the same boat because I've read them all as well, and I'm up to date and current. But he does that. He does, you know, a different sort of thing with the show than he has done with the comic, and I and I applaud him for that because it would just be too easy to sit there and go, okay, we're just gonna turn the storylines from the comic that we've already done into a show verbatim, and and it would be fun to see it play out in a different medium, but it wouldn't be nearly as interesting as the way he's doing it. Uh, my only – I had one complaint about the trailer, and I thought that it gave away a little too much. It doesn't give away details, but it definitely gives away a couple of plot points vaguely. Yeah, I mean uh, they made it very obvious they're they're planning to go to Washington, which we know how big that is, where that's going to hopefully lead us in a, uh, Season 7. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> he can <clears throat> – uh, or uh, – <laughs> but uh, – you know, my question, the whole trailer as a whole from seeing uh, Daryl and Glenn tied up and and Rick becoming badass Rick again, uh, the last, like, seven seconds had me just going, oh, damn, what's going on? <laughs> like, what's going to happen to Beth? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, see, and, uh, yeah, that got me pretty hyped up uh, in – and, it, and, you know, of course, it came at the perfect time because it's right around the corner from the show starting up again. So the, the, this is the perfect time to sort of kind of give that a nice kick in the ass and make – and it went viral. You know, I saw it all over Facebook. People are watching it. People are loving it. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about the show is, as far as the show goes, did, did you hear or see anything from the panel when they said a certain something about the show? Uh, no, the only thing I saw from the panel was some guy who wanted to ask Kirkman a question and they were like, well, Kirkman's not here. And then he showed up on stage. (laughs) Um, and then there were like these girls who were dressed like zombies behind the dude. It was really, I felt like it was a dream, but I know I watched it. Like it just, it was very strange to me. So, uh, what are you speaking of? You can fill me in on this one. All right. Well, Kirkman has confirmed we will see Negan in the show. He did not say when he, it could, he said it won't be for a while. Oh man. So he has confirmed that Negan will be in it, but of course, and we've talked about this before. We don't need to really go into it about how they're going to transfer that character from the comic over. And they also did reveal that Negan is actually based on somebody he knew in real life. Wow. Really? (laughs) I want to say that's what I read. Yeah. Huh? Whoever that guy is, screw him. What a jerk. (laughs) It definitely. I mean, you know, maybe you know, maybe he went a little over the top with a little bit, but Negan is definitely not a very likable guy. No. And so, uh, yeah, I got really excited about that. And then they they also had a you know, you know, a, a few things as far as the comic goes, as far as how far he's you know ahead, you know, to at least issue two hundred. He, he's already got that it's sort of so done. Crazy to me, like he is just. Like okay, and and we'll get to this later, but like he takes how Marvel has been planning their universe very seriously to a different level. Like Kirkman knows every move he needs to make months and sometimes years in advance. Mm-hmm. That is crazy foresight, dude. And see, the weird thing is, is that when he by the time he gets there, maybe his opinion and thought has changed a little bit. You know, maybe you know he maybe he you know he has it broadly kind of scoped out, and then as he goes along, he's discovered. Well, I'm actually kind of not going there anymore. So that's kind of a neat thing, is where as you know, you, you think you like a certain idea, but by the time you're done with it, you're you've sort of moved on and grown grown attached to another idea instead. So, you know, for that whole uh, whole thing regarding how far he has ahead, and then. The there's something also he said about how and he and he was very noncommittal as Kirkman often is with with any sort of answer. The big uh, question that 
I've heard come up about one the show and the comic, and there's people on both sides of the fence. Could this series continue on without Rick? And I think maybe we discussed this in vague a little bit before about trying to ready Carl in for that role. Yeah, we discussed it. Um, I feel like episode six, seven. I think it was yeah. your your interview episode. We discussed the possibility of of this. Uh, what we're seeing now with Carl going to the hilltop is the start of him becoming the man, Carl, and not the boy. Yeah, and so I guess the question was, you know, would you ever kill Rick off? And he was very uncommittal about it. In other words. You know, not saying yes, not saying no. Uh, but definitely, that could be a, a big plot point at some point, but you know, only when it's ready. Well, yeah, but you know, the, I hate to say this because you know comic book fans, and you, you know the mixture of comic book fans with the internet. Um, so my thing is this. Um, how do I word this? See... I've lost my train of thought. See dun, how that dun, dun. see how that happens. I hate my brain. Um, no, but okay, that's what it was. So the internet and and the comic book fans, uh, you know, Rick dying is something that I don't care how quote unquote secretive you try to keep it. As soon as it comes out, it's going to be spoiled all over the internet. Oh, you know it. No matter which medium, whether it be the comics, whether it be the TV show. Rick goes down, and it's going to make the the headlines of Yahoo News. It's going to make the headlines of this and that. They might not necessarily go, oh, Rick, the main character from The Walking Dead is you know being killed off. But they might go, hey, a major character, and that's going to intrigue some people who don't want to read the comics. Oh, wonder what you know half witted person they're killing off this time. Click. Oh, it's Rick. What? What? Yeah. It's going to spread like wildfire in a really bad way. Oh, yeah, and the Internet's like that, and that's one worry about, you know, I'm not going to get a chance to see, you know, some of the films that I want to see. And it was the same way with Avengers. I didn't get a chance to go see it, and the whole movie got spoiled for me pretty much within a few weeks of memes, of, you know, just pictures getting put up. It was like, okay. And and then I saw the movie much later on. But it, it, the Internet's like that. You've got to be careful. If you don't want to know, and even then, sometimes you can't even uh, help that. You know, so you you can think if I don't want to know something, I'll just stay away from Facebook, and that could work for like a short thing. Like if you're not getting a chance to watch, uh, you know, The Walking Dead or some other TV show that you're into, like Game of Thrones, you know, if if you can't see it that night or for a few hours, yeah, you can stay off Facebook, stay off the internet. But if something like in a comic book happens, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, sometimes you don't know. And that's unpredictable. And something like that could definitely catch on fire yeah. as far as like uh, like just the information of that. Could, I mean, because that's a big plot point. Okay, so speaking of uh, spoilers, and uh, this is a very small tangent. I just needed to get your opinion on it, so bear with me. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts, and this is away from The Walking Dead, but what were your thoughts on Expendables 3 leaking 100% authentic weeks before the movie goes to theaters you know it, yeah okay we talked about this before with like doctor who and uh and with the uh donna justice script and everything like that and, and then we and then we went on to praise the internet well i'm gonna sort of go on the opposite side the internet can suck sometimes because it sort of sucks the fun out of everything you know it is Expendables three something that I might go see in theaters? I kind of want to, but I don't know. But I I don't know if I'm gonna have the time. But I do want to see it. And that spreading that information like a freaking virus online, you know, it it makes me weep for the people in the that worked on that project, who put their heart and soul into it. They should. They deserve to have their project or their film, what a video game, comic, album, music, whatever. They deserve to have their time to let that be seen and and, and in its limelight. And to get robbed of that's just a, such a shame to me. Well, I mean, it's still going to go to theaters, but I, yeah, like yeah, what well, was it like two million downloads in the first week? Yeah, and and that does express a desire for the people who really want to see it, and and I and I get that. But what if those people then decide not to go see it in theaters, and that's going to rob them of revenue? 
and the movie's going to mo- tank. Yeah, and the other ones have done so well, and they are what they are. They are action movies with little to no depth, but that's fine. That's what they're supposed to be with all these people from all their action movie histories in it. It's supposed to be over the top, kind of kooky, and that's cool. That's that's awesome. But the fact that I just hate how it's potentially going to damage it. Yeah, I mean, imagine if, uh, and it wouldn't because, you know, Lord Emperor Michael Bay. If this would have happened to Turtles, that movie 100, I do not question it, the movie flops. Mm -hmm. Because all the doubters who have to go to theaters to see it, myself included, I'm a doubter. I don't think it's going to be good. I mean, I hope it's good, but I can't. I can't have any high expectations for that movie. I mean, I have higher expectations for, say, Dawn of Justice, which I think you have stuff to talk about. Yes, Uh, I do. And, you know, with the few things I've seen that were leaked for Dawn of Justice, I'm really excited. See, and that's a good segue because I want to go right into that. Uh, I've said before, I have a hard time getting excited about, about, like, comic book movie news because I just got so over um, just wore out on them you know Marvel did their whole phase one thing and it was pumping out movies pumping out movies DC was much slower because uh, you had all just a couple of Batman films and the Superman film but for me I just got so wore out on them and some of them were in my opinion just not that great uh, Iron Man 2 that's my opinion uh, uh, Iron Man 3 that's my opinion See, and, and uh, you know what? I haven't seen Iron Man 3 because I have almost no desire to. I hate to say this, but Iron Man 3 damaged the image of Tony Stark for me as a whole. I mean, RDJ does a great job, and he's the only... Well, him and Ben Kingsley as the Mandarin um, were the only two saving graces because their acting ability is so stellar, having mm-hmm. nothing to do with how awful the script was. Some of the decisions they made are just... I mean, can I say something? Will you be upset if I spoil something in the movie? Go ahead, for go, go. They remove his arc reactor. They get the shrapnel from his heart. How? Why? He has no need for that now. How is mm-hmm. he still Iron Man? Right. What's he just going to be a dude in a suit? It takes away from the heart and soul of the character. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, getting back to my point, I I got generally disinterested uh and i just i i had no desire and and this came out with the avengers and that that was part of the reason why i didn't go see it i had no desire to see it i heard it was great and that's fine and i'm not gonna you know i'm not saying that it was a bad film i thought it was wasn't as great as what people were saying but that's partially because i was so wore out of the concept now after uh seeing dark knight rises which I pretty much went to go see simply because I was already invested and I'm a Nolan fan, like a film. I love almost all of his. Actually, I can't name a film of his I don't like. But I went to see it, and I mean, it is what it is. I didn't think it was terrible, but I thought it was a decent and I would have done it differently. But that's fan writing. I can't do that. I can't talk about that within this. So going forward, and they were talking about bringing in a Justice League, and I'm like, well, here we go. Another another slew of superhero movies that I just don't really care to see. And then Man of Steel came out. And then this. And then they, well, first off, I want to say what they cast, uh, you know, Ben Affleck as Batman, which everybody who I worked with said, oh, it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's horrible. They're automatically judging it before they're seeing his performance. It's so weird because the same thing actually happened to Heath Ledger. And he is, in my opinion, the greatest that ever played the Joker with Nicholson being an insanely close second. I mean... Two different kinds of the Joker, um, but Ledger did a proper crazy Joker. Well, yeah, they're different. They're different Jokers. They're different kinds. But what they showed um, for that teaser for for you know for Batman v Superman, because at first we just saw Affleck in the outfit, and that instantly got my attention because it was so derivative of like Frank Miller and his Dark Knight Returns outfit. You know, kind of more Hollywood eyes. It's obviously, you know, been armorized a little bit, you know. But I'm like, that is neat. I like where they're going with that. If they make him like this gritty, kind of pissed off, angry, older Batman, it'll be neat. Because that that creates the tension with that younger Superman. You know, this younger kid doesn't know what he's talking about. And Superman's like, this crazy old guy (laughs) 
flying around in a damn plane thinks he's a superhero. Yeah, and he's, I mean, and and from a species perspective, Superman's like, dude, I'm a, you know, mm-hmm. I, I can crush you and it's nothing. Exactly. Okay, well, going forward, be, before seeing that, that teaser where, I mean, they had like Batman, was he, he was like hooking up the bat light? Yeah, well, yeah, he was... Uh, uh, remo- removing the tarp and actually tarp. yeah this showed as i'm sure you you're gonna talk about it showed the more authentic frank miller styled bat suit with the glowing white eyes and all yes yes and i, and I thought that was neat because that has not been done before uh you know especially for like batman i mean i don't think you can count iron man because it's a robotic suit and you know the eyes are sort of what it is you it would look goofy if you just saw you know, Downey Jr.'s eyes kind of just threw it, uh, other than the the initial big, you know, Iron Giant suit that he had when he first created it. But to see that on the big screen, it went, oh, gosh, don't get me into this. I was actually kind of thinking that. Don't make me want to go see this. I, I don't want to be disappointed. And and it's kind of sad that I went there, but I watched it again and again. And they, they also, they you know, they pan up and they show Superman, and he's got, like, the red eyes. Yeah, he's thinking about heat vision, visioning Batman. That's a hard thing to say. Heat visioning. Heat visioning. But you know, it just and it was a short little thing, but it got me. You know, where are they going to go with this direction? The people who they've cast it in. It definitely seems like they're getting all their ducks in a row, and I want to see where it goes. And uh, speaking of casting, um, well, not casting because I can't remember her name, and I don't want to look it up right now. Uh, but Wonder, Wonder Woman? Woman. Wonder Woman. Yes. Guy Gadot. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. They also revealed her outfit. Yeah, it's a uh, pretty dope looking. It's more bronzed and dark. Um, yeah. It's not the traditional red, yellow, and blue of Wonder Woman, but I like it a lot. Well, see, uh, the tone of the movie is definitely a lot of like gray, a lot of dark gray, monochrome. Like, yeah, a lot, a, a lot more of that. And it every image so far from that has been even in the trailer or the teaser trailer has been that is, you know, a lot of blues, a lot of grays, a lot of, uh, even, I guess you could even say maybe brownish, but I, I get where they're going with that. And that fits right in there with that, with, with the tone of it. And uh, you know, who knows, maybe like we said before, they are going to bring in Aquaman and, you know, maybe they'll bring in, you know, you know, Oh, what's his face. I can't think of his name now. Green oh, Lantern? Uh, no, 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 no shit. Martian Manhunter? Dude, that kills Superman. Oh, oh, Doomsday. Doomsday. Oh, okay. Why was I thinking Dark Side? I don't know. Oh, well, because, I mean, Dark Side's a badass, too. I mean, yeah. yeah give him props. You know, one thing I was it's surprised stupid. by DC's panel, um, kind of talking into what you're talking about, I was surprised, one, they didn't officially announce any other casting and what they were doing. Mm-hmm. So we don't know what Momoa is doing. We have no idea. The Rock has apparently signed on to do something DC, but he won't talk about it. And that rumor is that he might be Shazam or Black Adam, which would be both very good castings. But man, I just you're you, they're really squeezing. They're putting a lot into one movie. Well, yeah, you know, maybe it won't. May, yeah, and maybe it won't be that. And if they do, it might be a little bit too much. But they're definitely. They're taking a clue here from the whole Marvel thing. They're trying to like get in on it before it becomes too much overkill, and they're trying to get some big, you know, some big hitters in there to try and bring people in. You know, people who maybe not be interested in it. Maybe they, maybe they're not into comics or the characters, but they, but they like The Rock and his action movies. And they're like, well, if he's in it, I'll, I'll go check it out. It's reaching a more casual audience. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, anything else on the DC world? or Honestly, I think that's all I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to talk about that teaser and then the Wonder Woman thing. and it just I'm actually getting excited for it, and that scares me and excites me at the same time. Well, that's okay. Um, that's what superhero movies are actually supposed to do. They're supposed to give you hope one way or another, and some of them destroy you, and others you know, make you really uh, happy and impressed. Um, so talking about San Diego Comic-Con here, uh, we're going to discuss now a little bit about, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. 
And uh, the panel they started with was... Um, the panel they started with was Ant-Man. And they brought Paul Rudd and uh, Michael Douglas on the stage. And they brought the... They announced... You know, new characters. They're gonna have uh, Hope Van Dyne um, and Yellow Jacket are gonna be in the movie. So hmm. to me, yeah, and I thought that was cool. Um, and apparently they showed test footage or newer footage. Um, and then I know on the show floor at SDCC they actually had the helmet of Ant Man on display. They also had the cowl for the new Batman, right? They had yeah. that there too. They had a lot of cowls. It was like. They yeah. had all the movie cowls, and then they had some different artist renditions of cowls. One I saw was just brilliant. It was a Batman cowl, but he was painted to look like the Joker. That's different. Uh, yeah. If you get a chance, look it up. He's kind of got longer ears. You'll know because it's it's <laughs> a very classic Joker look. It's not a like smeared face Heath Ledger style. This is a very, you know, each line on his face is painted very delicately, and he comes alive kind of. Right. Um, so, you know, am I excited for Ant-Man? The answer is maybe, and I'm not really sure how I feel. They took Hank Pym and Scott Lang's story of creating Ultron, and they just handed it to Tony Stark uh, instead of going, okay, we can put Ant-Man here. Another thing that worries me about Ant-Man, they keep losing directors and cast members. It's like... One person shows up, you think they've got someone locked in, and someone else has to move in on it. And it's terrifying when you've got something that I thought Edgar Wright's vision was probably going to be something I would enjoy seeing. Now there have been so many other hands on it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to have to see some footage to actually go, okay, I trust this, I guess. Hands in the air like I'm not sure. Well, uh, see, yeah, that's something about other films that happens, unfortunately, just way too often. When you get a, a dedicated direction in there and you got people coming in, replacing writers, directors, producers, and it's like some guy writes a script and another guy rewrites it and another guy rewrites it. And then you have four other directors during that time. So the, the original vision is somewhat very diluted by this time. Yeah. And it's not like you're going to have Pulp Fiction without Tarantino and Edgar Wright had his hands, and I mean for years, ever since they announced Iron Man 2, they were announcing Ant-Man. That's how long they've been waiting on this movie, and Edgar mm -hmm. Wright was so invested and had such a a brilliant idea for this story, considering what he had to work with, the fact that you know, you're not creating Ultron and Hank Pym's story. You're going to have two Ant-Man men, I guess you'd say Ant-Men, um, because Hank Pym's going to hand his mantle down to Scott Lang, uh, no Wasp. They haven't cast uh, Janet yet, which is weird. I mean, she's one of the original Avengers. Get her in there. Come on now. So are they going to try and work him into the next Avengers film? Are they? Well, is... we're going to kind of talk about the next Avengers film. Um, and, and, and I know you don't mean Age of Ultron because uh, Age of Ultron comes out before Ant-Man. Right, yeah, that, but well, you that's mean, what I meant. That's you're the, the talking one. three, which is, um, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, in, in my head it is penned. You might have heard it here first at Journey into Comics, folks. I think it's going to be Avengers Infinity Gauntlet, uh, especially after what I saw in the theaters this weekend. Uh, Guardians, we'll get to that. Uh, lots to talk about there. Try not to spoil too much. Keep a lot of things vague, but give you guys enough of a review that you're going to hopefully go see it. Um, because I think every single person that is a fan of comics or a fan of movies or a fan of sci-fi, they can relate to this movie in such a way. But we'll get to that. So after the Ant-Man panel, they move on to the Avengers panel. And dude... There were like 40 people on stage. There really weren't 40. I think it was like 13 or 14, but <laughs> seriously. I mean, uh, Downey Jr. comes on stage. He's throwing roses at people, and then it's Hawkeye and Hemsworth and Cap America. And then, you know, at some point they introduce Quicksilver. And then 
you know, Scarlet Witch is on on stage as well. James Spader, who's doing the voice for Ultron, is on, and everybody's getting questions asked. And then the best part of the night, I think, for Marvel happened, and they show the first trailer or the teaser, if you will. It was like a 45-second clip of Age of Ultron. And it starts with some of the male Avengers, not necessarily Quicksilver. It was uh, mainly like Thor, Iron Man, Captain America, and uh, Rhodey, who plays War Machine, uh, all in Stark Tower or Avengers Tower. And everyone's trying to lift Thor's hammer. Of course, no one has the strength of Thor, you know, so no one can possess the, the hammer. And Captain America actually moves it a little bit. And it's like, whoa, he actually has enough strength to move it a little bit. And then out comes an old suit, and you hear it kind of clinging and clanging around, and it's Ultron. (laughs) And, you know, he's very... At this point in the movie, you can tell that Tony Stark's experiment has failed him because he's saying there's only one path to peace, your existence. Essentially saying... I'm getting ready to wipe every single person on this planet out, and there's nothing you can do to stop me, and I'm a robot. (laughs) So, you know, they do a montage of scenes, and, uh, you know, Stark says some things about, you know, him helping finish the path he started everyone on, becoming the first quote-unquote superhero. Um, They did tease the Hulkbuster armor, so apparently Hulk and Tony Stark go toe-to-toe awesome uh i've been hoping for hulkbuster armor i was hoping for it in the first avengers movie let alone to now know that those hopes and dreams are validated coming into the second movie then ultron at the very end says look and he looks all pearl uh polished and pearly and and you know in his final form you know like kind of like cell he's just (laughs) flowing and he said no string on me Essentially saying that I'm not your puppet anymore and I can do anything I want and take out everyone. Um, So, and that was the end. And you think, like, the teasers can't get any bigger for Marvel. You just, holy hell, really. Like, let's do this. And then uh, Josh Brolin, he was in Men in Black 3. Uh, He's been in some other roles. Don't ask me because I'm not really sure of his full background. But he shows up on stage with the Infinity Gauntlet on his hand, a foam version of the Infinity Gauntlet, mind you, because he was announced as being cast as Thanos. Um, And he asks Robert Downey Jr., who was throwing roses out into the crowd and handing them to the other Avengers and stuff, where's my rose? And he says it all dark and Thanos-like. So RDJ hands him a rose, and he eats it. (laughs) <laughs> and that's how it ended. That was the end. But then, little transmission feed pops up, and it's James Gunn, director of Guardians of the Galaxy. And he goes, hey, San Diego Comic-Con, how's it going? And, uh, well, he goes, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for this, But July 28th, 2017, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 will come out. They've already got it in the books. They are doing a second Guardians, and they don't, they, at that point, they didn't know how successful Guardians was going to be. Um, and I think, I think they had an inkling. They, I mean, you would hope, but it's like, as I said, on pace to break some records, it might actually break 100 mil in its first weekend, and it's an August weekend, so it's not still prime summer real estate. Uh, August is where things kind of start to slow down. I mean, the, I don't remember what the previous record, who held that for a while, but it's going quick. Well, you know, this the, they're kind of tapping this to be like the big summer blockbuster because – there really hasn't been that big a one. Uh, for I mean, there, there's been a few other successful films, but nothing like monsterish. You know what I mean? Well, no, you're right. And I mean, forty million in the first two days is, and I mean, you gotta think Thursday's preview screenings, which are open to the public. Obviously, it's their quote unquote midnight release. They just do like a seven o'clock, a ten o'clock, and then the midnight 
So it's only three shows, and then they've got their full first day on Friday. They'll have all of today, which is, as of right now in movie theaters, over. We are into Sunday. And then they'll have all of Sunday. But, I mean, in the first two days, they haven't calculated Saturday yet. They're at almost half a mil. Or not half a mil. Half of a hundred mil. So, for me, Guardians did something that I think the Avengers might have been able to pull off that would have kept you uh, more uh, into the idea of superhero movies. Because Guardians said... Look, we've got this team. You don't need all their BS backstory. Here they are. Throw them together. Push them out the door and make them do what they have to do. And it worked so well. I mean, this movie, Guardians of the Galaxy, um, first of all, I'm going to say it was a five out of five. Uh, big points that are important. It evoked almost every emotion that I have. I laughed. I cried. I felt uh, nervous for the team. I... Um, had some moments of confusion, just like, oh, what the hell is that? Uh, but overall, it was so sincere. The way they utilized a soundtrack to be such a pivotal part of the movie. Not, not the score of the movie, not the orchestral score. I'm talking the songs they picked that were from the 70s to make this movie have a really great depth that made you feel very attached to the characters as a whole. Ugh, so, had to adjust. Sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> Guardians just did so many cool things. I mean, uh, I was telling you off air, like, one of the two characters that really stole this movie for me were Drax, uh, played by Batista, and Rocket, which I knew Rocket was going to be awesome, but just it was beyond his funny that made him so brilliant. And Drax was sincere, very angry, and wanted to avenge his family's death, but so serious that he actually came off as kind of an idiot. And that's not a bad thing uh, because it was a comical idiot. Uh, you know, they're talking in the ship, and Star-Lord's telling Gamora... He doesn't. He doesn't get it. It's going over his head, and Drax, stone face, just goes. Nothing will go over my head. I have fast reflexes, and I will jump and catch it. Like not getting that. He, they're talking metaphorically. Something going over his head, and he is very dead set on no. Nothing will go over my head. I will jump and catch it. I don't it's care so how damn. high up. <laughs> just so damn literal, yeah. And and that's what made him so funny. And there were so many genuine lines that were delivered by Batista's character that made the movie just perfect. Well, you know, it's almost like he has no sense of humor. Well, you're right, and and there are some really dark lines in there. Now, one thing I will say about this movie, uh, for any of you adults that are listening that have children, it actually shocked me. They cursed quite a bit. No F-bombs dropped. They almost did once, but everything else was pretty much in the movie. Hmm. Um, yeah, which was shocking. I mean... Yeah, that's interesting for such a, uh, you know, a movie designed to be such a big blockbuster. I mean, yeah, you can have some cursing in a film, but especially something that's you are probably going to take your family to go see. It's a Marvel movie. And I saw families that were there with their with their kids and, and you know, people were laughing all the same. But uh, any of you who are thinking about seeing it and you're on the fence about the 3D IMAX, it's worth it. It is so worth it. It was so good. Uh, they did certain parts of the 3D IMAX so well that it felt like I was moving. Um, just the way they utilized your depth perception and the camera movements were very fluid that you started to feel like you were a part of the film, which is what they've always marketed IMAX as, become a, be, you know, be a part of the movie. But a lot of movies don't necessarily capture that. Uh, even Amazing Spider-Man didn't necessarily fully capture it. This is the first movie I think that it was made 100% for IMAX. That was what was first in mind. And it shows very clearly how brilliant they did that. You know, utilizing that technology to make such an epic scope in its film. So, I mean, I definitely want to go see it. I'm not sure if I'm going to get to seeing as how busy as I've been. But I definitely want to go see it. And you hyping it up for me really makes me want to make time next week to go see it. No. But there's, there's oh. something else that happened over CDCC that definitely got my attention. 
And even as somebody who has been sort of shined away from comic book movies and sort of worn out on the concept, I would go see this in a fucking heartbeat. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. Oh, you, the teaser for Deadpool. Yes. Yes and more yes. Uh, it's funny. I was on uh, my phone. My morning ritual is to... Uh, wake up, I grab my phone, I spend about five to ten minutes determining if I want to set another alarm, and if I don't, I instantly go to superherohype.com. And that wasn't a plug, actually. It's just where I you get my news. Um, but I go there, and it says, you know, Deadpool test footage revealed. And I was like, oh, come on, this is some phony baloney BS. Click on it, and it looks real. It sounds like Ryan Reynolds' voice. Everything is very CGI, which was confusing. I was like, okay, I don't know if I like this, but oh well, let's watch the footage and see. And um, well, first of all, I tried to watch the footage, and it's taken down already. And I'm like, oh, I missed it. It was only up for like 15 minutes, and it got pulled super quick. Um, so then when I found it, I handed it to you, and, and what did you see? What uh, This movie, if it were be, to be coming out next month, from just the little clip you saw, what did you see that made you so excited to want to go see this? Well, number one, it's – we've seen Deadpool at a film before, uh, and I didn't really feel like that was an authentic representation of the character. I feel like Ryan Reynolds could do a good job at it, but I don't really feel like that they got that. And that, it, that was the first Wolverine uh, like backstory movie. Was that yeah, Origin? Origins, Origins? Origins. Yeah, X-Men Origins. And uh, <clears throat> I feel like they kind of ruined it. And – so they, uh, I know Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds, I can't talk, has been very adamant about wanting to go back to that character and do a proper film, not really, not even associated with the Origins movie. And so when I saw it, and it sounded like him, just like you said, and it just came off as exactly how you would read it in the comic, but it's on, but it's on screen. And then it was the the over the top, quirky action. Because that's how that's how he's written, and that's how he's presented, and I feel like they 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 nailed it. Oh, they definitely nailed it. And then, um, you know, I go and I'm searching and I'm doing my thing, and I happen to run across the high def version of this because the original version I sent you, Brando, was actually somebody that had like recorded it from their cell phone while mm -hmm. it was still online because they had the wherewithal to go. <laughs> This is going to come down really quickly. Might as well grab it while I can. Uh, so, you know, I watched the high def footage and I get to actually hear the proper audio that was meant for it. And uh, things I noticed Deadpool's interaction with the camera breaking the fourth wall was done very well. Just in the few minute or the, what, I think it was like a two minute clip of test footage. Yeah. Like whatever. But then the other thing I thought that was awesome is just some of the lines and the way he delivered them as he jumps off the bridge to land in that. SUV, he says, and I quote, I hope those boys decided to wear their brown pants today, you know? <laughs> and then he jumps through their window and scares the hell out of them. So, see, and it really makes me happy because it really seems like, you know, he, it's not just him wanting to play that character because he knows it's popular. It's like he has to like the character. He has to, he really has to get into how that character is and how to portray him and how to deliver those lines. No, absolutely, because that's Ryan Reynolds' real-life personality is that kind of guy. I mean, he isn't actually Deadpool, obviously, but he has that quirky, over-the-top so over sense of humor that's just right for the character. Um, but I wanted to tell you there was one thing about Guardians I did kind of forget to mention. I decided to bring it back up uh, just real quickly. Now, this is something I used to do, and... Brando will remember this from the old days of the podcast. Right now, I'm going to warn you that we're going to go silent for a second. This is where I'm going to tell you if you do not want spoilers for Guardians. Right now, I'm going to tell you in the future. I'm going to come back and tell you. So, future me, take over. Jump to 52 minutes and 54 seconds. Okay, so no more chances. We're going to go ahead and get into this. Now, Brando... Uh, you can choose to mute me if you want, man, but I can. I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the post credit scene. Right. I, and it was funny. I don't know the details, 
but I've already heard about it oh, uh, vaguely. Yeah, uh, most people it, have. Because of the internet. <laughs> um, yeah, damn internet. Uh, so let me go ahead and then I'll just break it down. We, we're going to give people plenty of time to know what's going on. Uh, so in Guardians, there's a scene where finally they are giving the Collector this orb. The orb that you saw in the first teaser that... Peter Quill picks up and they say drop it and he just drops it on the ground. So the collector is finally getting the orb and you know he opens it. And what does he find inside? And this is why I talked about Marvel being so brilliant about setting it all up. He finds an infinity stone. And they explain that the Tesseract and the ether from Thor the Dark World and all those things are infinity stones that have been hidden away in objects to preserve their anonymity. So this slave to the collector sees the Infinity Stone, and she's sick of being his slave, so she grabs it, knowing it will kill her. And there's a huge explosion in the collector's place. Now, one thing I noticed in the collector's room, uh, he had one of the dark elves from Thor living in a cell, uh, and he had one of the Chitari from Avengers. He had Cosmo the dog, who was a... Russian dog that went into space in the Marvel comics. Very weird, but he had him. Uh, so there's this explosion. You know, the guys and, and of the Guardians, they all get out. And uh, so the, the post credit scene happens, and it's back with the Collector, and he's just, like, holding his head and drinking a drink. And Cosmo the dog has been freed from his cage because the entire place got, quote-unquote, blown up. And Cosmo licks his face, and there's this raspy voice that just says, you let that thing lick your face. And it pans, and it's the 1980 Marvel movie character, Howard the Duck, looking all creepy, old, and CG. And I just went, that was a perfect ending to this movie. They didn't hype Age of Ultron. They didn't give a shit about anything else. They just went, here, this is stupid and makes no sense, and that's why it's perfect for the end of this film. So, with that being said, we are, I think, officially going to go ahead and have to go back in time. So, at this point, Brando, tell us to go back in time. We need to get to 88 miles per hour. 88? <laughs> 88 miles per hour, you dumbass. So our flux capacitor can be fluxing? It needs to be fluxing. What the flux? <laughs> Come on, man. All right. Where we're going, we don't need roads. Whoa! Dude, we traveled through time, I think. My face, it uh, it's smushy feeling, I think. It kind of gets that little... Kind yeah, of thing. Uh, that's a weird yeah. feeling. I feel, I feel like someone punched me in the balls. Dude. Time I travel sucks. I, I don't give a crap what that crazy Doc Brown says. It you, We go much faster than 88 once that hits through. It's crazy. Oh, yeah, it's like 140 minimum, and that's like going <laughs> slow. And I mean, you don't need roads. There's no friction. You go faster. I mean, that's science, bitch. All right, well, uh, well, speaking of time travel, uh, I want to segue in, in, like, into some video game stuff. And uh, Cool. You know, we talked about all the stuff at like CDCC. I've got a few things that were video game related that go on to that, and then we're going to time travel into some of my new additions to my retro collection. And uh, but as far as the Comic Con stuff goes, we now have a release date for the Uncharted film. Oh yeah, shit! I forgot to talk about that. What's that date again, dude? It is uh, June tenth, twenty sixteen. Oh wow, June tenth or twenty sixteen is going to be packed it again. Is be packed. And they don't have anybody. I don't know of anybody as far as casting news is to play Drake or anything. Of course, there's a few you know guys I think that could do it well, but. There's one I just I, I'm sorry I know he's a fan favorite but I'm sick of seeing him and stuff. If it's Nathan Fillion, I'm not watching. <laughs> I think he's a little bit too old for it now. Yeah, who voiced uh, Nathan Drake in the games? Oh, uh, Nolan North, I, I believe. I believe it was Nolan North. I'm gonna look that up while I'm talking because uh, Nolan North actually he's done a lot of. Of voice stuff, and he doesn't even change his voice. Um, he he played Desmond in uh, the Assassin's Creed series. Sick. 
He also played in uh, Spec Ops The Line as the main character in that. Oh, dang. And also, he was also apparently in uh, General Hospital. <laughs> that's a uh, that's weird. General also, Hospital to video games. <laughs> right. But yeah, he played... Uh, I, I was right. He, he does play Nathan Drake. He also does a lot of different, uh, you know, video game voices and everything. Apparently... Um, he, he's also in a lot of cartoons and, you know, he's a voice actor that gets around, but there was another big role. Yep. There it is right here. He plays in Batman Arkham, the, the Batman Arkham series as who the penguin. Really? Yeah. What? That's cool. Yeah. Nathan and, Drake, uh, the penguin. And so one thing that is really cool about how they, uh, about how they uncharted games go, they actually, film all the cutscenes on a soundstage and all the voice actors actually act out all the motions and they record their dialogue at the same time. So you get a really genuine performance. And they did the same thing for another really big title that came out last year. And I love it to death. And this was also another big announcement. They are making a film for the last of us. Really? Yes. Uh, all it was just it, it, like all the pretty much was a reveal is, hey, yeah, we're making a film for this. Cool. But they uh, for that game, they 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 filmed all the cutscenes the same way. All the all the voice actors were on a soundstage. They performed together. And I feel like that game has some of the best uh, acting in general. The main guy that plays. Uh, um, what's his name in that damn movie? Joel. Uh, and then I got to remember his name now. <laughs> which oh. uh, it, it was on the tip of my tongue but it, but, it, but 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 I lost it trying to get him and uh did, did Troy Baker of course he played he also played in BioShock Infinite sweet he also Troy Baker also played the Joker in Batman Arkham Origins if I remember correctly oh that's sick and he also does Two-Face as well wow i mean Two-Face that's not that you know Two-Face would be hard to to be both roles you know what i'm saying like yeah cuz it's also Right, uh, but he does a good job at that. Uh, he also he also has another big role coming up in video gaming uh, called uh, I don't know Revolver Ocelot. Oh, he's gonna be the new Ocelot in the, for the uh, for the Phantom Pain. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. They, I mean, this guy does such a great job at what he does, and I the the thing is is that he takes the Joel character. And embodies him almost. He, you know, he has he, he, you know, like they're from Texas, I believe. So he's, he's so he's got that southern twang to him. And even then, like the opening video, which if you've never played The Last of Us, Nate, go do it. I, I started it, and then um, Sarah's brother took his PS3 back. Anyway, okay. <laughs> well, guess what? Uh, because moving forward. As far as like stuff I've added to my collection, I bought The Last of Us again. Oh, that was a beautiful uh, segue. Well, it, it sort of is because I'm not going to go directly into it, but let's just say it sort of came out on on the PS4. Yeah, I, I had heard that they were doing that. Yeah, it, it, like it, like it is basically a remastering. It's in full 1080p. It's in uh, you can turn the the uh, you can actually turn this on and off. You can either lock the frames per second at 30, or you can have it all uh, off, which I think it runs at like 50-ish or something, and it looks fantastic, I think, and with it off, it looks even more realistic. But it just if, if you thought the PS3 version looked good, which I think is the best PS3-looking game, uh, the best-looking game on the PS3 that I've ever seen, it I looks even better on PS4. That's weird. I don't know how that is even, like, I mean, li literally, I don't know how that's possible. It was, well, I do know how it's possible technology is moving forward, but... Seriously, Last of Us on PS3 looked really, really great. I mean, some of the... Here's my biggest test, and I've always said this. It's all about the water. Mm -hmm. If you can get your water right for me, or your rock textures, as weird as that sounds, that's where I'm sold. Uh, and that's actually how the first Bioshock game got me. Because the demo, you know, you're coming out of the water for the first time. I was like, this water looks so fucking real. Right. What is going on? Um, the thing with that is that The Last of Us really has that feel of nature taking back, uh, like the cities. You know, kind of like uh, the the I Am Legend effect or uh, Life After People. And uh, 
So I really liked that look of it. So seeing that in a film, it's it, it'll hopefully just be as awesome as it was in the game. And I, I kind of hope they just don't take the game story and run with it. It's a great story. It is a fantastic story, but it's a story that ha- that has to be told over time because it, it it does take a little bit for that narrative to really start going in and you find yourself attached to these characters and you see them becoming sort of like attached to each other. Yeah. But that does but that that I, I'm not sure if they could really do that in two hours. I don't know. But I'm excited for that. And then the last bit of news f- uh, that I have that I want to talk about here to keep it short. I don't think it's any secret. I am a huge Mass Effect fan. Really? Oh um, no, right? Yeah. Um, but so they news had a, to me. They they had a panel and they didn't reveal a lot because they're being very secretive about the new Mass Effect. And pretty much what they did reveal was the the stock armor for the male and female hero, the N seven armor, and they it, it looks entirely different. They're going in a different direction with it, and Another thing that they uh, they revealed is that the, this game is going to have a big emphasis on planetary exploration. For you to be able to go to an unknown planet and explore it. Oh, that's it, badass. Very much like the original game. Now, the original game did it, and for the time, it was sort of impressive. It, it gave you like a square map where you could go. You had to drive the Mako around and get stuck, which they brought back the Mako from the new one. It's a newer Mako. It has newer physics. It has no cannon on it, so you can't fight in it. It's meant to give you. It's it, it's meant to get you around on the surface faster. So and it's ma- kind of like the Warthog in Halo. It, yeah, that or it, it kind of reminded me of like a mix of that, and maybe the Tumbler a little bit, just the way it was moving, moving, like moving along and everything. Okay. It, you know, and it, it was really cool. And the fact that they're kind of bringing the range back a little bit, they're not revealing anything about the story or even where in time this takes place because a lot of people want to know, is this before Shepard's story? Is this after, you know, or is it somewhere during? And they're being very noncommittal about an answer on that right now. And so, but just the few things that they showed, you know, I I don't know. Maybe it's just the fact that I'm just a super fan for this series. It definitely got me going. And, and I watched the whole panel and honestly, uh, the questions that people would ask, they couldn't answer them. (laughs) <laughs> a lot of them simply because it would like it would reveal too much well and see that's where i get a little frustrated with these sdcc uh panels and 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 different video game panels for reveals like when nintendo has reveals and stuff it's like if you're gonna start to tease people at least be able to answer questions mm-hmm. and, and 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 have you know what people are going to ask you can go on the internet and search, and people will have asked every question that the thousand people that are going to be in Hall H are going to ask you. Have your thoughts planned out, and at mm-hmm. least give them some form of an answer instead right. of a well. Unfortunately, due to spoilers, we can't comment at this time. Like that's a piss out. Like it's a cop out. Yes, I, I do agree. I got to hand it to these guys though. They did, uh, you know, they did confirm a few things. They did confirm that. You know, there are going to be uh, aliens on your squad, just like in the previous game. So they they did say they want to make it as much of a new experience and a brand new Mass Effect as much as they want to give you things that are familiar. Now, that is vague. That is a very vague answer. And they did say a lot of things for you to be able to read into. Uh, but that just means so much to me. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it. I cannot wait to play more. I can't wait to go exploring again because Mass Effect 2 and 3 were not about exploring. It was about the the, the upcoming war, the upcoming invasion of our galaxy and our our imminent extinction. So it was it, it was like, we don't have time to go exploring. We have to go stop this. <laughs> and, no time for exploring. Right. So uh, that's the last bit of like news. There wasn't... Uh, for me, a whole lot of news that I was interested in that I just kind of cycled through. I mean, they, you know, there was some here and there, but they don't bring a lot to a Comic-Con because we have Gamescom coming up. Excuse me. Oh, man, that, that Strawberry Crush is getting to me, man. I told uh, you. It's all about that Orange Crush. Orange Crush. All right. Well, anyway, <laughs> I I did mention that I added uh, The Last of Us Remastered to my collection. Now, that's not retro unless you count last year. And, the, and then unless you count the PS3 as retro, which 
I only count it as retro, really, is if it's no longer um, the current gen, which I still kind of consider PS3 to be current gen because new games are still coming out for it, and it's still available in stores. Yep. Uh, so I did add quite a bit since the last time we talked. Uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, I was at his wedding in June, and uh, he realized he didn't get me a gift for that, and I don't want anything for that. I, I was his best man because he was my best man at my wedding. And he shows up and he goes, hey, I got you a game. I'm like, well, what hell? Okay. <laughs> and he got me Joe and Mac on the Super Nintendo. Now, this game is a sort of a side-scroller platformer. And you, and, you, and it's two, one and two player. But you, you run around as like, as like a caveman with a club. And you can throw bones and boomerangs. And you're beating the hell out of like other cavemen and, and uh, dinosaurs getting through the level to save the hot cave chick. At the, you know, at, at the end, and uh, you know, he bought it, and it wasn't working, so I cleaned it up. I cleaned the contacts and everything, and it fires up now. But you know, that was so cool of him to you know think of me when he's out getting stuff that you know he wants to get. And uh, so yeah, I added that one, and then I went out and I got a a brand new Game Boy Advance. Okay, new to me, Game Boy Advance SP. Now I already had one, but for those of you that might not know, there's actually two different versions of the SP. There's the original model where that, that lights up. Then there's another model that lights up a little bit brighter because it actually is a legitimate backlit screen. The other one is just a sidelit screen, so it's a little bit dimmer. And so I found a backlit one for, you know, pretty cheap, about 35 bucks. It wasn't too bad, I thought. And and not to mention, they're kind of the the Model 2s or the SP Pluses, I think that's what they were called when they came out, they're kind of rare in my area. I've only ever seen one other one, and it was in kind of a bad shape, so I didn't buy it. So I, so I picked that up, and I picked up uh, Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance uh, for Sick. that. And uh, then I went out. Oh, uh, I went out, and I actually went to the Devil's Play- uh, Playground, a.k.a. GameStop, because <laughs> back in February... I. Uh, they convinced me to get a pro membership because, and I thought maybe I'll use it to pick up some Wii games because I wanted to add to that collection. And you know, if you're a pro guy or pro member, you get access to like their little bit cheaper discount rate or whatever it is. So I just figured, what the hell? But the guy at the counter messed up my information, and apparently he could, you, you can't fix it in the store. You have to call tech support. Oh lord. And, I work nights. I ain't, I don't have time for that shit. And they're not open on Saturdays. I got that fixed over my shutdown while I was on vacation. So I went into GameStop and I got Rayman Legends on the Wii U for my, basically more so for my wife. I do enjoy it, but she absolutely loves it. And I wanted a physical copy of it because she was so impatient that she couldn't wait for me to buy it physically. She had to get it digitally on the Vita. <laughs> so I bought a physical copy of that and then I picked up uh, I, I rebought Fallout 3 for the Xbox 360. Sweet. And uh, I picked up one of the launch titles for the 360. Perfect Dark Zero. That's not a very great game, but it was a dollar seventy. Was it so the I, collector's edition? No, it was not the collector's edition. It was just the one of the uh, you know regular copies that were out there. But for dollar seventy, I'm like, I can add this. I have Perfect Dark on the N64. I never played it actually. I've heard not very good things about it, but I w- it was about the fact that it was a dollar seventy. Hey. And then, uh, uh, my buddy, the same buddy that that gave me the Joe and Mac copy, uh, he actually had some games he was selling, and a couple of them were on the Xbox. Two of them I never owned. I actually owned its third older brother, but Ge- but the Gears of War series I got one and two now. Sweet. For the three sixty, and then um, he also sold me. Uh, a game I used to have, my favorite wrestling game on the PS2, SmackDown vs. Raw 06. I absolutely love that title. Love the GM mode on that. I played the hell out of that. But anyway, uh, I also picked up the the uh, sort of remake or definitive edition of Tomb Raider on the PS4. And uh, I actually had that. I actually have it digitally on the, on the PS3. I, I ended up getting a $20 credit on the PSN. And... Uh, they had a half off sale on Tomb Raider like a few weeks after it came out or like a month after it came out. So it was 30 bucks on the network. 
I had twenty dollar credit, so I spent ten dollars for Tomb Raider uh, last year when it was brand new. Oh, that's awesome! Just I didn't know if I was gonna like it, you know. Yeah. And I I loved it, and I wanted to get a physical copy of it. And then when I heard it was coming to PS4, I'm like, well, that's the one I'm gonna get. I ended up buying it, and uh, moving in to, to the last couple that I picked up, I went out um, last weekend with no intention of game hunting at all, but. I think maybe you can attest to this when you don't really have an intention of buying anything and it just sort of happens. Well, sometimes you have to, man. If a, if a good deal smacks you in the face, you got to jump at it. And uh, I'll get to that here in a bit. Uh, but keep going on what you're talking about, man. All right. So uh, I didn't intend to buy any games. There's a store in my area. It's a little bit pricey. I don't. I bought some stuff there in the past. Uh, stuff that's a little bit harder to find, and I'm and I'm okay with paying like five to ten bucks more for it since I can't find it anywhere else. Uh, but this place is a little bit overpriced, and I went in there with the intention of finding one of those uh, Wii uh, Wii Classic controllers because I wanted one for my uh, for my Wii U. And uh, I went in there, and they said they told me how much they were. I'm like, eh, okay, I'm not really interested in paying that much right now. And I walked around, and you know they had a few deals for what I would consider a fair price to pay for a game. And then I walk in the back and I see all these games are half off. And I'm like, well, I should look at these. And I see some games that I want to add to my collection or that are at least on my list to get because when I started wanting to collect, I made a list of stuff of like, I want to get this stuff because either I didn't get a chance to play it back then or I showed some interest in it and never got into it. So I want to give it another shot. So I picked up four games for $6.50. Okay. Okay. And they are Splinter Cell on the Xbox. Sweet. Splinter Cell Chaos Theory on, on the Xbox. Oh, Chaos Theory. Awesome. Splinter Cell Double Agent on the PS2. Cool. And Gran Turismo 3 on the PS2. Oh, sweet. I got all of those for a measly $6.48. And I was just elated because in, in, in this sort of place that I you know, have, have gone to in the past, I don't expect it to like that. In fact... They don't. They're, they're they're like a smaller store, and they and they price their games. I saw a copy of the first Splinter Cell. The one I got was like two ninety nine, marked down, or, or or like that was the price. And then like another one was was nine ninety nine. Oh wow! So I picked up the two ninety nine one because it was in the exact same shape. And then I'm thinking, okay, and maybe they're gonna say this. The price they have on this is what this is gonna be the half off price. But really, the price they have on it should be the price, and then I should get half off of that. And thankfully, that's exactly what it was. And, oh, and I wow. walked out of there. I I had no budget for gaming, you know, hunting or anything like that. I sort of kind of, you know, blew it already on some of these bigger stuff that I got, like Tomb Raider and Last of Us. But I walked out of there, and uh, I'm like, I'm like, read them and weep, you know? <laughs> and then, of course, the wife's like, what? And I'm like, I bought games, and they were $6. <laughs> and she's like, I can't even be mad for that. That's awesome, you know? That's what I live for with, with game hunting because it's such a different thing from hunting or collecting other things. You can find great deals, and you you and sometimes it's in the place where you don't really want to go and look. No, yeah, you're right. It's funny that you mentioned other kind of collecting and hunting. As everyone knows, obviously, journey into comics, I collect comics. Um, on the opposite end of what you're saying with finding really good cheap deals, because I mean, as we all know, video games. If they're not a super popular title or a super rare and hard to come by title, they usually get really cheap really quick. And perfect at some Dark point, <laughs> what's up? I said perfect Dark Zero. It's perfect a Dark Seven. Yeah, perfect Dark Zero, right? Like, because it's a non-important. It was a launch title. Nothing special about it. You can find it cheap. So on the opposite end of that, comics don't do that. <laughs> the longer they're out, the higher in price they usually are. Um, last, it would have been two, two Thursdays ago, okay, uh, Sarah's dad and myself go to the comic shop, and the dude's like, hey, uh, we got a collection of Spider-Man in, uh, what are you missing? And we give him a list, and he goes, okay, we'll come back next week, and I'll have these priced for you. So we go back next week, and he's like, I don't have these priced for you, if you come back tomorrow, have them priced had just been so busy and we're like okay so we come back the next day and 
Sarah's dad decided that he wasn't going to tell me his plan. Usually we kind of discuss and strategize like, okay, if we're going to go for one of the three uh, key issues, which one do you shoot for? And there were three key issues that we wanted to look at. We wanted to look at number eight, which it's only a key issue because it's under 10. And any Spider-Man under 10 is ridiculous. That's in the first year that they ever printed Spider-Man um, in 1963. Uh, they had number 15, which was the first appearance of Kraven. Um, and he's part of the Sinister Six and one of the staples of Spider-Man's uh, rogue gallery of villains. And then they had... Amazing Spider-Man 121, the death of Gwen Stacy, what the movie Amazing Spider-Man 2 essentially is about. Um, so we had talked pricing, and I'm writing with Pat, and he's not talking about what he's getting. He's just like, well, how much do, you know, like 8 and 15 price those out for me? So I look up on eBay or whatever, and I'm like, oh, they're about 250 300 up to the five or 600 range in the higher grades. Um, we'll see. The place we go to is great. Sometimes you get really cool deals, and other times you get screwed because they have really high pricing, kind of like what you were just saying with this store. So we go in, and we're like, all right, we're here. You know, did you price them out for us? And he goes, yeah, look at the list and tell me what you think. So we look, and 8 was $135. Bucks. Uh, 15 was $125, and uh, 121 was $200 because it's – literally one of the most key issues of spider-man so uh i look at pat and i'm like dude if we're going for one we have to do 121 i mean in my heart and soul really that's the first one you go for uh it's just such a pivotal issue um and we've only ever seen two copies one was a graded copy that was six hundred dollars and it was only <laughs> graded at like a 7.5 and then this copy uh which we didn't really get a good look at so Pat's like, okay, we'll take all three. And my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, what? He's like, oh, don't worry. I just had my teeth pulled a few weeks ago. He had some old messed up teeth. He's like, I had some of my, some of my teeth pulled, and I put that on this here credit card, and I got $250 in reward dollars. So half of this is paid for for free. And I was like, oh, you're a smart dude. Way to go. So we got all three. Uh, 121, I was kind of sad. We get it uh, in the car. I start flipping through the pages. Kid that owned it wrote his name in the inside. Mm. But that's a thing that, as a collector of comics, you have to deal with it. Um, especially if you get a really good deal on something you're not ever going to get your hands on again. Uh, yeah. Because kids in that era did that. I mean, there are even, you know... A lot of comics you buy that are older have creases in the middle because they would fold them up and put them in mailboxes. Yeah. And that was just what they did. They didn't know any better. They don't know the value of these books, you know, 50 and 60 years ago. They just were giving you your mail. Well, you know, it's kind of like I, I get this sometimes. And, and, and fortunately for me, I'm a little bit, you know, it's a little bit better for me because I can actually clean this up. But I bought Super Mario Kart over over my vacation. And Andy apparently owned it before me and wrote his name on it. And I, you know, I erased it with some, you know, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. So Andy has been erased from ever having that game. Oh. But I imagine it's not so easy or practically impossible. You don't want to do that for your, especially how old some of those are. And, and, and you know, you don't want to you know, risk the condition that well, these comics are already in. And there's a precedent. In the comic book world, as I said, you know. You know you're not going to necessarily get a flawless copy. There's going to be torn pages. There's going to be possibly water damage. Some of these comics back in the day sat in basements and collected mold and mildew. And there's a very distinct, and I love the smell, but there's a very distinct smell when you open up an old comic that's about 50 years old. And it takes you to a very, in my opinion, at least for me when I'm opening these up, it's a very zen state. I smell the comic and I'm just there and I can look at it and I can get I can look at all the details. Um, so to kind of finish up on the collection end of Spidey, I don't want to wrap this around too long. There were other comics that were in that run that this guy brought in and we went back this week and um, I'm happy to say and those of you who are in the comic world will know exactly how huge this is. We now have a run of Amazing Spider-Man that starts it issue 101 and is all the way to current 
uh, and that's over 700. Uh, so it's like we have like 672 issues of Spider-Man with only about 41 left to have every single Spidey in existence. Wow. that That's awesome. I mean, that is so cool because to me that shows so much dedication. Well, and, and as me and Pat were talking, dedication and timing is everything. We, mm-hmm. a few months ago, I would say January, maybe February, went into 10th Planet. And again, like this past time, uh, Dan, the owner, is like, hey, what do you guys uh, need in your Spider-Man collection? I just got a 129 in. 129 is so important because it's the first appearance of Punisher. So, okay, how much? You know, I've seen the uh, Punisher issue go anywhere from, and this is not a joke, 350 all the way to 1500 What? What? Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. Well, a mint condition copy is about 1500 Right. Um, so we are just bracing. And, I mean, I, I'd even talked to a lady online who was, quote, unquote, desperately trying to sell her 129 and she wouldn't take anything less than 700 I'm like, lady, if you're, quote, unquote, desperately trying to sell it, you'll take anything for it. Um, that's the definition of desperate. You don't care what you get for it. So don't put that mm-hmm. in the description, you know. And she's like, "Well, I would maybe take five, but," and I was like, "That's still ridiculous." So we walk into Tenth Planet. Dan's like, "Okay, I've got a one twenty nine, and uh, here's the price." And he said two hundred bucks. Boom, we buy it, you know, no question. So in this new run that he just got, that we just picked up some stuff from, he's like, "I got another one twenty nine in. Do you guys want a second one?" And we're like, "Yeah, don't worry about it," you know, and didn't ask him about pricing or anything. I looked at the condition of the one he has on the wall now as opposed to the one we got. The one we got for $200 is a higher quality overall. More crisp edges, nicer binding, uh, pages are more white. His copy in store now is $700. Bucks. Hmm. So, like I said, timing is everything, honestly. Um, so, uh, that pretty much wraps it up for the comics and the video games and the everything brando i did record something uh we talked about this off air i'm gonna let brando listen to me struggle trying to speak i've got this thing called the voice jammer i'm getting ready to put it on with my headphones or i'm getting ready to let you hear me having the headphones on and talk very very much like a special needs person it's not intended to make fun of anybody don't get that wrong. This is literally just uh, an app that causes you to be able or be unable to speak properly. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play that here in a second. Uh, Brandon, did you want to add anything before we start the closer? Well, buddy, uh, I tell you what, I get such a kick out of hearing you know your stories about collecting, and I think we need to get together sometime, do some comic hunting, do some game hunting, and I think that would just be a cool story to share on the podcast. Oh, absolutely, dude. There are so many, like, low-key hidden locations and stuff in my area. And I don't know how many comic shops you have in your area, but you know I used to collect more modern video games, but still video games, I mean, from PS1 on. Mm -hmm. So I would love to just go with you on that journey because, dude, as you said, you're just looking for that deal. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's it's funny because we're doing the same thing, but we're in two vastly different realms of it and with two different mindsets so it'd be really cool just to like you know get into what you're and have an understanding what you're talking about and then you know for say same same with for you likewise for you to be able to kind of come along and kind of see you know i might see something but i'll pass it up and you're like brandon why are you getting this and then i can try to tell you why and then it it'd be just kind of a cool thing for us to do i like that i like that a lot um one last thing i wanted to add uh on air how do you like that Xbox light, dude? Dude, I fucking love it. Uh, if, we didn't mention this, uh, but Nate used to work at GameStop, and he inherited that light as an advertising light. It's up there for you to say, hey, this is where the Xbox shit is uh, in the store, and he had it for a long time. And he, when I told him about my uh, game room and getting it set up, he donated it to the game room, and it looks awesome in there. And if anybody wants to see it, I post the pictures up on the Instagram, and I'll probably do it. I'll put what put it up on the Journey into Comics Instagram as well. Sweet, yeah. Uh, that that light man. Honestly, we were Xbox was done. 360 was moving forward. 
they're going to throw it away. They had two of them. One was a PS2. One was an Xbox. I wanted both. Somebody else said, I want the PS2 one. And I was like, well, I can't be a selfish bastard. So, yeah, go ahead and take it. And I'll go I'll go with the Xbox. Not too upset about it. And the light oh, is beautiful. That green light is just so cool how it comes out. But uh, anyways, we're going to go ahead and play this clip. We'll talk our way out of this. I'm going to be a special kid for a few minutes. And uh, hope you guys enjoy. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying this thing thing called a voice, a voice speech jammer. God damn, I can't uh, talk. Call. <laughs> it's really hard. So what I'm trying to, to trying to do now is trying to <laughs> talk to you about when the Xbox and the PS4 sales. Okay. <laughs> So, it's, I'm trying to hear myself, but it's, it's like I'm, I'm on a delay, so I'm trying to talk and talk, and, and it's not working is so good. So, what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> PS4 sells out the Xbox 3 to 1, 1, 3 to 1. So, Xbox, you get your dick kicked in. I'm done with this thing. It's terrifying. <laughs> so what'd you think of that? Oh, dude, three to one. <laughs> one. I said one twice, I guess. That's weird. Oh, that was good. It messes you up. Like, you think was... you can do it. Like, I really screwed the parameters up. The secret to that voice uh, speech jammer is to have the milliseconds on the delay kicked on the low end so mm -hmm. that the delay is quicker. And and you hear you're hearing yourself just barely off, and you can't tell what you're hearing. You want your head to hear what you're actually trying to say, like me talking right now, but it's putting just enough of a delay that you're not sure where your voice is coming from. <laughs> and that was it was terrifying. It was so weird. That's cool, man. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Kevin Kraft. I don't know that he'll actually listen to this one, but uh, those guys do that on the Ellis Show is a bit for pretty much anything they they actually had kevin interview mike shinoda from lincoln park like that and mike didn't know what was going on <laughs> and they and they just and they told him they told mike they're like this is just one of your fans who's a special needs fan oh and they it was funny it was really a good bit i was like oh that's classic but i just wanted to see if it would work it works that thing is real it's called speech jammer it's on uh, google play um as always, if you got a Facebook, like us. If you like us, tell your friends to like us, and then tell your friends to tell their friends to like us. Let's get this ball rolling, and maybe we can break 500. Maybe we can yeah, break 1,000. That'd be cool. And, hey, uh, if you come on board with us, man, we're, you know, we're, a loving, we're a loving podcast. We want to give back. You may just win yourself a little bit of a uh, you know, cool little comic book there. Well, yeah, we talked about the comic book, and uh, – I haven't actually ran this by you, but fuck it. Might as well just talk about it now and get it out of the way. I was thinking maybe one month uh, as a random giveaway, we'll make some kind of post or something and give away a one-month subscription of either Loot Crate or Nerd Block. Dude, that's awesome. I mean, just to one random fan, <laughs> we'll just go on, we'll pay for it, we'll set it to their house. Once the one month's up, we'll cancel the subscription. Sorry. And then... Uh, yeah, they'll get some random cool stuff from us that we dude, don't that, even know. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. I mean, it, trust me, if I could, I would be on that Loot Crate shit. I I love watching people unbox that. Yeah, uh, we have Nerd Block. We're actually getting August and then canceling <laughs> Nerd Block. It's just been really blase lately. I mean, I've gotten yeah. some really cool shirts, some turtle shirts and stuff. But, you know, I think Loot Crate, you just get better stuff, and it's did you, cheaper. Did you see what was in the Villains? For for the for the shirt, no, jokey. It's a it's like the Joker and Loki like fused together. Oh my God! I must go find that. Oh yeah, you should, man. It was pretty cool. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this was episode nine. We got through it. Yep. Uh, next time, hopefully, uh, we have pretty big news, and hopefully, next time we have this podcast, Mister Patrick Lowry will be uh, with us. And our official third co or official host, third host, 
Am I saying that right, Brando, third host? Uh, we'll have another co-host for the show. Let's put it that way. Okay, there, there, that's fine. Um, I, uh, You know, one more thing, just to interject right there. I'm just going to put my foot right in there and cut you off. I hope my microphone sounds really good. Uh, I think I mentioned it on the last one. I was going to be getting a new one. It is here. I'm using it. It's awesome. I feel like I'm actually on the radio. You sound really great, man. Honestly, it's a, it's a kick-ass mic. Uh, I think you got it on Best Buy, but... It's definitely mm-hmm. if you're if you're doing a podcast and you're trying to sound more pro, go with whatever the hell Brandon bought because it, <laughs> dude, it's killer. It's great sound. Yep, it's a Samson. It's good. I like it. Cool. Anyway, I will catch you guys later. All right, and uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I am Groot. I am Groot. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, I am Nate Phillips, and we also have with us. The one and only Brandon Stone. He did that very dark and terrifying. I thought he was already was, off air. I wasn't expecting you to toss me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, we're so unprofessional about it. Oh, well. Okay, we'll try again. I'm Nate Phillips. And I am the gamer Brandon Stone. Catch you guys wherever we catch you. Like us on our stuff and things. Thank you for listening to Episode 9, Journey into Comics. Stuff and things.